Hey, this is Kettering Elphonic. Today I'm going to show you a video of creating your very first Nexus level from scratch. And I'm going to assume that you have no knowledge of editing games or creating levels for games ever before. So let's go ahead and get started. Very basic how to start the editor. You would play Nexus like you normally would from the library. Instead of playing Nexus though, you click launch editor and press play. Okay, so let's first talk about what you might see when you come into the editor for the very first time. Here I've restored the default layout of CryEngine 3. For most of you, this is what you're going to see whenever you open the editor up for the first time. Now, generally the theory behind creating a level is you have this mass 3D space and you're placing in shapes, lights, and entities to form a game level. You can almost think of making a level almost like you'd be playing with Legos. You're putting pieces together to create one big 3D environment. First I want to talk to you about the one of the really important things to have on your screen when you're review developing and it's a bar underscore display info one. But that's what's creating this a numerical field up in the top right hand corner of the viewport. And here you can see some primary fields. The only ones that really kind of matter for you right now is the camera position. And that's these uh, three values up here at the top left that's showing your X, Y, and Z coordinates. So whenever you're moving around in the scene, those will get updated automatically. Then you have what's called DP, that's called your draw prims. And you can see here there's a, there's a count um, of how many draw prims you're currently rendering. Under draw primitive, is an easy way of saying it is it's an object that's in this a unique object in the scene you can almost think of it like that so if your draw prims are going higher and higher and higher that means uh, you have a lot of unique objects or things that need to be in you know you can see the drop prim count here is pretty high but that's even because these little icons are considered draw prims even though the object you might think it has no cost everything has some sort of draw primitive cost to it that if it's rendering in the scene then you have polys, which means your polygons, and the polygon is a triangle. So can, if you imagine you know, a, a face or a square, like you would normally see it, like a plane, is made of two polys. It's two triangles. Like, then you have the frames per second down here, and that will show you uh, your current frames per second. Uh, keep in mind that even though you're an editor, sometimes your frame rate might be higher, or might be lower than what you're actually experiencing in game, and that's due to a lot of reasons, especially if you're playing against bots, there's higher CPU load. If you're playing online, there's a lot of dynamic events going on, allowing a lot of players creating more particles and uh, and if you're also the server you're going to be having some more strain on your CPU. Um, let's go ahead and talk about this upper toolbar up on the top of the screen and there's, one, there's a bunch of little buttons here and I'm, I know it might seem overwhelming at first uh, so I'm only going to tell you some of the bare basics that I think you will need to know in your normal usage of the editor. Um, first there's the undo and redo button uh, I haven't done anything but as you can tell if I move an object around uh, the undo button becomes available so I can press the undo button but now the redo button comes available uh, the, there is a shortcut for that it's uh, and, you know control Z is definitely a very common button you a shortcut you'll be pressing and that's a quick undo and definitely something you know I recommend remembering all these keyboard shortcuts as I spit them out because it will save you tremendous tremendous amounts of time if you're using keyboard shortcuts as opposed to constantly trying to find and use uh, icon buttons on the screen. So over here you have what's called a link object and unlink object. So uh, many times throughout the making a map you might have to link two objects together and this will let the game know that these objects should be working together in some sort of way. This over here is a select all types you can basically so if you have a bunch of brushes in the scene or entities and you're not you, you haven't really been using layers too much you can choose like select entities only for example and it won't select any of the brushes it won't select anything else other than a placed entity again also you can do brushes and no brushes all sorts of different options for you to be able to pinpoint your selections and very carefully uh, generally we don't use this too much but there has been times where we have needed to jump in uh, then you have the select tool and this simply lets you select you, you can't modify it in any way, shape, or form. You'll find that sometimes you might want to use select tool if you're going around your map and 
clicking and investigating on a lot of objects and you don't want to accidentally move, rotate, or scale anything, the select object uh, tool is very useful for that. Move, it lets you move an object around. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, rotate, it lets you rotate an object. Uh, scaling, it lets you scale an object. And then we go over here and this uh, this where you see this local and if you're in uh, the move tools by default it says view. Uh, this changes the uh, coordinate base for movement or rotation or scaling so it's a it's like a coordinate space so uh, we'll go into that a little bit more detail later I don't want to overwhelm you too much right now uh, and then this is the XY coordinate and that will constrain movement to X and Y only or rotation or scaling Okay, so this button over here, this is uh, what you do to uh, turn on grid snapping or change the size of your grid. It's very important to note that the button itself turns on and off grid snapping. The little arrow right next to the icon is what you use to change your grid size. Next to that is angle snapping, and that's useful if you're rotating an object and you want it to snap to very specific degrees of angles. And you want to do that because whenever you're moving an object on the grid or your angle snapping, it's a lot easier to make sure when you're placing more objects on top, round, etc. You you will always be able to generally get things back to where you need it to be, move objects on top of each other, and make sure if you're using modular assets, they'll snap into each other perfectly as they tile. Now, these two things are very important and you should always try to build on a grid and use angle snapping as much as possible whenever you're rotating objects. It's understandable that, that it can produce some unnatural, unorganic feelings if your level's too uh, straight angle and too, you know, not, you have too much snapping going on, it can make it start really feeling unnatural. So sometimes it's good to get, let those things go and add some uh, more natural feelings to your map. And that's usually done through the third party 3D software used whenever you're modeling your map. So, okay, over here on the right, you'll see the material editor you can open up that with that button uh, this is the database view and if you click this arrow a uh, small arrow on the the right of those icons you'll see some more icons up appear and um, here you'll see the flow graph button and then you'll see the tech terrain textures this is where you can modify terrain layers and stuff like that and this is lighting this lighting isn't to be confused with the time of day this is where you control hemisphere lighting and things like that it's very natural like you're actually thinking of uh, you're controlling the sunlight's uh, orientation uh, with the poles on a planet kind of okay and this on the right is what we call the roll-up bar and the roll-up bar has different areas in these tabs at the top of it and you'll find us like using these a lot through our tutorials and everything like that uh, just to quickly go over them you got the objects this is where you can place entities brushes things like that uh, the terrain modifier it's not just for terrain you find your vegetation tools here the environment tools which uh, contain a lot of stuff that lets you control the HDR brightness in the map and uh, the ocean shader and sky stuff and all sorts of things uh, the display tab it lets you hide objects by category so if you don't want to see things like brushes you can just hide them really easily and there's just different categories where you'll be able to choose and filter things out you can also enable or disable render settings a lot of these might go against what's in the config specs or might be what you might see in the video options in Nexus itself uh, sometimes if you don't want to see the terrain you can turn that off you can turn off the ocean uh, you can turn off the skybox itself so if you want trying to get some wireframe pictures and stuff like that uh, you can easily do that so generally want to keep all this stuff turned on then the last tab is the layers tab and this is a very important tab for organizing your map it might seem tedious at times but we strongly recommend you and you'll always hear us talk about these in our tutorials how important layers are uh, for you to make sure you're not hating yourself when you're getting deeper and deeper into developing your map it's very important to keep organization in mind whenever you make anything because these levels can get very complex you don't want to spend time filtering through all sorts of like piles and piles of entities this works very similar to the way a Photoshop layers work except it's nothing more than organization you can't do any especially like blending or anything like that but you can do parent and child layering so you can create a group and like hide that entire group uh, make certain layers selectable only uh, hide certain layers and things like that 
Okay, just going to show you some useful menu toolbars. These are, you know, just for now, there's a lot and it gets really complex, but here's some main ones you might want to keep in mind. Here in the file section, this is where you save, open a map, uh, export to engine. So you got to remember, this is really important, whenever you save your map, you're not actually saving uh, what the engine reads whenever you play the game. So export to engine actually compiles the map real quick and makes a file that the engine reads whenever you start up Nexus and you play it locally. Now whenever you publish to Steam Workshop we automatically generate this export to engine for you so you don't have to worry about that if you're just doing a normal save and you export to, and then you publish you're going to be publishing the latest save on your local machine change map options this is really important this is the dialogue you see when you first create a map we are able to set the music the game type the description and title and the loading screen and stuff like that generate surface texture that's going to create the the texture that the terrain uses even though you're creating like a bunch of dynamic textures and you're play, placing them around at the end you're going to want to generate a surface texture all the time because that creates a compressed texture and you can set the resolution and things like that Publish level to Steam Workshop. This is what you use to get your map on Steam. Export selected geometry to OBJ. This is if you have, for example, making your maps out of solids and you want to take this work and do something like 3 Studio Max or Maya. You want to select those solids and export to an OBJ and then re-import it into those tools. Config spec. This menu is literally what you see in of the video options where the slider is that goes from low to ultra this is exactly what that is these these five options right here you can ignore Xbox 360 emulation and PS3 emulation because those don't really apply to you in this case okay so the biggest thing to keep in mind here is that I know it says very low to very high consider very high is ultra and very low is low Okay, the group menu is if you have a bunch of objects selected, you want to group them. This is really useful for organization, but also useful for other techniques that I'll show you later on. You can group an selected objects or ungroup them. You can also open them, open the group so you can edit individual entities within a group, or and then reclose it if you need to. In the view menu, the main thing to keep in mind is, you, yeah, you got your roll-up bar in case you accidentally close it. If you accidentally close your console or the status bar at the bottom, uh, that's where you do that. But here you go in the open view pane. This is where you want to, this is where I usually at least, whenever I need to open something like a material editor and stuff, even though there's buttons, it's just easier for me to select them all from here. So it's really kind of a, a matter of preference, but I prefer to use them all in this one big list. Okay, so one really cool thing with uh, CryEngine 3 and the Sandbox Editor is the ability to really customize your user interface, and you can do a lot with this stuff. For example, if you don't like the way certain icons are laid out in the menu, you can literally drag them off, and you'll see the menu, the whole scene will adjust itself. Uh, you can close those down, what, what have you. For example, here in the console, one thing I do is I always detach the console. Now I have this left click selected and I'm holding it down while I'm moving it. Now you'll notice on the screen there's a bunch of icons that appeared. These things in the center on the left, right, bottom, and top. And these allow you to, to literally dock this menu to the left side. If you hover over the icons you'll see it'll give you a preview of the amount of space it'll be taking. Now what I'd usually do with something like this, a console menu, which I generally like to have open, is I'll let it float. And whenever I create a floating menu, I can resize it and do whatever. And whenever I'm editing, I usually use a dual monitor setup just because it's easier to manage and always have these screens open. Now the really cool thing is if I want to have the material editor open all the time and not have to constantly go here to view, open view pane, and click the material editor, I can actually have that dock into this floating window and you'll see here in the center of this floating window a new button has appeared and you want to click that in the center and it'll create a tab here on the floating window and generally whatever whenever I get my editor up and running I'll open up all my favorite menus uh, the flow graph material editor everything and dock them all in this floating window so that way I can easily just tab through them whenever I need to make changes so I just want to quickly show you also the tools preferences menu 
and here's where you can change a lot of stuff with the editor and the viewports in general is one of the big ones there's a lot of options here uh, for you to be able to edit and work with one big one that I know is a pretty much a default in CryEngine 3 free SDK is this um, where is it show snapping grid guide and this is something whenever you have an object selected it'll show a grid and that grid represents the grid snap size and so just so you can see like if you move the object you know how much it's going to move and stuff like that I found that it's always getting in my way but I know if some of you are coming in from the free crying engine 3 SDK you may have gotten used to that so that's how you turn that back on or off if you need to I always keep that thing off you can do also do a bunch of other stuff you have uh, movement controls and things like that for example if you're holding shift and moving uh, you can increase and decrease your speed pretty quickly the gizmos you can control the size of the axis the helpers which are the little 3d meshes that appear on top of icons and things like that okay so for basic movement and stuff there's a lot of different ways you can move around the 3d viewport the way I prefer to do it is I hold my right mouse button and I turn to rotate around and I use WASD just like you'd be playing in game D and A are for strafing S and W is going forward and backwards and that way you can easily control wherever you're looking uh, more like if you were in a game you also have the controls familiar to 3D Studio Max for example if you hold alt and then press the middle mouse button you would pivot and I'm not really sure how it chooses the pivot point or where to rotate around but that does work um, you can also hold the mouse button down and you can pan the screen if you use the wheel you can zoom in and out one thing really cool thing I like to do is if you're moving around with the WASD and right mouse controls you can hold shift and you'll speed up and again you know in the tools preferences you can control how much of a speed up multiplier you have when holding down shift down here on the bottom side of the screen you do have the ability to insert this speed value and there's three predefined values 0.1 1 and 10 this is the speed of the camera so keep that in mind so if you're needing you have a big map and you need to cross it pretty quickly turn up the speed a little bit and if you're doing some really fine detail turn the speed down just so you can keep yourself grounded and not moving around too quickly Two really important buttons in the editor that you'll see on the bottom of the screen is the mute button and that's if you have a bunch of sounds playing in the editor sometimes uh, the jump pad particle effects will have the sound attached to them or there's a lot of sounds in the environment things like that you don't really want to hear it especially when like strength is spawning in sometimes it can really bug you so you'll just press mute and all sound in the game is turned off another really important one is AI physics and what AI physics does so if you turn this on, it's going to start initializing anything you have in Flowgraph, as well as if there's any animated objects or anything with physics in the game world, they're going to initialize and start acting real time. So now you can see this wheel's turning, because since I turned on the AI physics.